Hi, ladies and gentlemen, this is Ms. Skoken, back for another round of AP Statistics. This time we're in Chapter 5, Probability, and Section 3, Conditional Probability and Independence. Our objectives for this section are to calculate and interpret conditional probabilities, and just as a reminder, those are related to the conditional distributions that we learned about in Chapter 1. Use the general multiplication rule to calculate probabilities. Use tree diagrams to model a chance process and calculate probabilities involving two or more events. Tree diagrams are one of our favorites, especially for conditional probabilities and and probabilities. Determine if two events are independent and when appropriate, use the multiplication rule for independent events to compute probabilities. So what's conditional probability? The idea behind conditional probability is we already know something has happened. And if we already know something has happened, what's the probability of something else happening? So for example, let's say we know that someone owns their own home. And we want to know if we know that someone owns their own home, what's the probability that that person is a high school graduate? So what it does when we look at a question like that one is it changes our denominator because it changes what group we're looking at. So if we were to say, how many left-handed people are in a class and there are 100 people in a class and let's say there are 15 left-handed people, then our probability of a randomly selected person in the class being left-handed is 15%. But if we're interested only in the male group, then we wouldn't be looking at the whole class, total of 100. We would looking, be looking at how many of the students who are male are also left-handed. So of the male students, how many of them are left-handed. So that's a conditional probability. We look first at the condition of being male and then secondary, secondarily we look at the, at the probability of being left-handed out of that group. So we designate this with this symbol, that straight up and down little line that kind of looks like a sideways fraction bar and that's a great way to think of it because when we use the calculation and the formula, it does tell us what goes in the denominator. So the probability that one event happens given that or knowing that or such that another event has already happened and we already know about that, that's called the conditional probability. So the probability that event B happens knowing that event A has already happened is going to be written as probability in probability notation as P of B given A. All right. When we want to use the formula, this is on your formula sheet. The probability of A given B is the AND probability between A and B, the probability of A and B in the numerator, divided by the probability of B. So that's why I kind of said that it looks a little bit, or we can treat it as a fraction bar, because whatever's on the right-hand side of that line right here, then we know that that's going to end up in the denominator. The probability when we switch the variables B given A is given by the probability of B and A divided by the probability of A. Changes only to the denominator. The numerator doesn't change because the probability of A and B is equal to the probability of B and A. Okay. The students at the University of New Harmony received 10,000 course grades last semester, and the two-way table we see here breaks down the grades by which school at the university taught the course. The choices of the schools are liberal arts, engineering and physical sciences, and health and human services. So what do we see? Uh, when we look at A, B, and below B, we see that we seem to have a lot of below B proportionally in the engineering and physical sciences. Interesting, right? So what we want to do though is we want to actually calculate the probability of L, which is a grade lower than a B, probability of E given L, or the probability that the grade comes from an engineering and physical sciences course knowing that the grade is lower than a B, and we also want to calculate the probability of L given E, the probability that the grade is lower than a B, knowing that it comes from an engineering and physical sciences course. Let's take a look. 
First thing we need to do, of course, is come up with all of our totals. The total or grand total in the lower right hand corner gives us 10,000. That's the number of grades all the way across the university. And then we see the line totals and column totals or row totals and column totals. In order for us to calculate the probability of a grade lower than a B, we use the column total of below B and we divide by the grand total of 10,000. That gives us the probability of a grade lower than a B. Now, when we look at the conditional probabilities, we're not going to be using the grand total as our denominator because we're going to be looking at either a row total or a column total. And the probability of E given L or the grade coming from an EPS course, knowing that it's lower than a B means that our denominator is going to be the column total lower than a B and our row total is going to be the engineering and physical sciences and below B where they intersect at that 800 location. So 800 divided by 3656 gives us about 22% of the grades lower than a B are coming from the engineering and physical sciences school. Looking at it the other way, we're going to find the numerator is the same value. It's where the below B column and the engineering and physical sciences row intersect, but this time our denominator is different because we're taking the total of the engineering and physical science courses or grades, and we're looking at clearly half of the grades below a B are from the engineering and physical sciences. So we were correct in our initial impression of this two-way table. When we want to calculate AND probabilities or intersection probabilities, we can use the general multiplication rule, which says that the probability of two events both occurring, A and B, is equal to the probability of event A occurring multiplied by the, prob the conditional probability that B occurred given that A occurred. So we need to be very cautious about this because what this means is this will actually work whether events are independent or not. The old way that we used to look at probabilities didn't include the possibility that events would not be independent. This does. This accounts for either independent events or non-independent events. So we're good here. But of course, we can just multiply if we know that we've got independent events. We'll talk more about that later. This is a tree diagram, and the tree diagram, of course, we're flipping a coin. Once again, we're completely obsessed with flipping coins. And what we see is we have three different flips. We toss a coin, or two different flips, I'm sorry. So we're going to flip a coin twice. The first time we could get either a heads or tails with each having the same probability, 0.5 or 1 half. And then we toss the coin a second time, and again, we break down the two possible outcomes of a heads and a tails as each having the same probability. When we want to find the probability of getting two heads, that means we're going to go down the path of heads and heads, which makes sense because that's how we said it in words. The probability of getting two heads literally means getting a heads and then getting another heads. And we can multiply those two probabilities. They are equally likely events. We know that with a trick coin, we would have different probabilities, not one half and one half. If we were to look at all the different possible outcomes from two tosses, we know that we could have a heads with a heads, a heads with a tails, a tails with a heads, and a tails with a tails. So the probability of getting two heads or a heads with a heads is one half times one half or one fourth. Here we have a slightly more relatable example. The Pew Internet and American Life Project finds that 93% of teenagers ages 12 to 17 use the internet. Now what that doesn't say but does say, the subtext, is that 7% don't use the internet. And 55% of online teens, that means 55% of the 93%, have posted a profile on a social networking site. So the question is, what percent of teens are online and have posted a profile? So this is a perfect application for a tree diagram.
We start out by splitting up the online teens and the non-online teens, that 93% and 7% that we just talked about. And then again, of that 93%, we break down into having an online profile, 55%, not having one, 45%. Now, when we look at the teens who don't use the internet or are not online, obviously none of them have a profile and all of them don't have a profile. So that's that bottom branch with the 0.7. So if we wanna know what percent of teens are online and have posted a profile, then we are going to write it in probability notation using either the and word or the intersection symbol. And we know that the probability is going to be the probability of teens who were online, the 93%, multiplied by the probability of teens having a profile knowing that they're online or the 55%. So that gives us a 51% uh, probability of teens being online and having posted a profile. We talked a tiny bit about independence a few slides ago and now we're gonna go a little bit deeper into that. What that means is just because an event has occurred doesn't mean it affects another event. So to give you an example, if I flip a coin and get a heads, and then I flip the coin a second time, I still have a 50% chance of getting a heads and a 50% chance of getting a tails because the first flip doesn't affect the second flip. This is different than when we're pulling a card out of a deck of cards, unless we replace the card after pulling it out. So, Two events, A and B, are independent if the occurrence of one event does not change the probability that the other event will happen. And another way of saying that in symbols and uh, mathematically is the probability of A given B is equal to the probability of A, then that means that the probability of A happening is the same whether or not B happened. And this likewise with the probability of B happening being the same as whether or not event A happened. When events A and B are independent, we say that these probabilities are equal. And if they're not equal mathematically, then we know that we do not have independent events. When we have independent events, we don't have to use the general multiplication rule and we can just multiply the two probabilities. So the multiplication rule for independent events. We have this example, this is in our textbook, on page 329 and it says following the space shuttle challenger disaster it was determined that the failure of o-ring joints in the shuttle's booster rockets was to blame under cold conditions it was estimated that the probability of an individual o-ring joint would function properly was 0.977 if all o-ring joints either succeeded or failed independently what's the probability that all six would function properly and that is an and probability. It means they all have to be okay. And we multiply those if they're independent events. So we end up with a probability of all six working properly of 0.87. This means that the thir there's a 13% chance that something would go wrong with one of the O-ring joints. Okay, that ended really abruptly. I thought that there was a little bit more on that example on that slide, but we, we can look a little bit deeper into that. Just as a final note on that one, 13% is too much when we know we're risking human lives and super expensive uh, research equipment. So we definitely would never do that if we had gone through this and seen that these were, if they were all independent events. As it turned out, they were not independent events. There was a lurking variable and these failed for the same reason. So they, they were not a redundant system. Anyhow, let's get back to our summary. We have learned how to calculate and interpret conditional probabilities. We've used the general multiplication rule to calculate probabilities. We learned how to use tree diagrams and then you can calculate both, uh, and probabilities. We can also do combinations of probabilities using that tree diagram. Determine if two events are independent to see by seeing if their conditional probability is equal to the independent probability or the 
um, single event probability. And when appropriate, use the multiplication rule for independent events. Just a reminder, we need lots of practice from this section to be able to make sure we know how to solve all the problems. See you in class.